a very warm welcome to this webinar from a very chilly Paris. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome you all to this event, which is to provide some uh, updates on the ongoing work that we've been carrying out on the economic impact assessment for the two pillar solution. My name is David Bradbury. I'm the Deputy Director of the Centre for Tax Policy and Administration at the OECD. And I'll be joined today by two of my colleagues who have been uh, involved in leading this work amongst others uh, on a, a very effective team. Uh, we have Pierce O'Reilly, who is the head of unit in the Business and International Taxes Unit, and working in his team, uh, Anna Sinta Gonzalez Cabral, who is uh, uh, an economist working in that team. They'll both be presenting some of the latest results, uh, and we uh, uh, will certainly be, you'll certainly be hearing from them shortly. Now, before we launch into uh, uh, what will be at times a, a fairly technical presentation as we seek to take you through some of the uh, data choices, the, uh, the data and the methodological choices that have been undertaken to produce this analysis. I wanted to just say a few words of, of background to set the scene. Now, as no doubt you're all aware, uh, in October 2021, there was an agreement by more than 135 jurisdictions to a two-pillar solution to address the tax challenges arising from the digitalization and globalization of the economy. And since then, uh, the inclusive framework on BEPS, with its more than 140 jurisdictions, has been working towards finalizing the technical details of those two pillars with a view towards implementation. Throughout that process, uh, the OECD Secretariat, the team uh, that are represented by those that will speak, be speaking to you today, have been carrying out economic analysis to inform ongoing decision-making as part of that process. But just a few words on the two pillars. Uh, pillar one, which involves uh, a reallocation of taxing rights and the granting of a new taxing right uh, with respect to the largest and most profitable multinationals, those above uh, a revenue threshold of 20 billion euros. Now, this new taxing right uh, is allowing uh, more uh, taxing rights in market jurisdictions. Uh, it is very much directed towards not only achieving that uh, reallocation of taxing rights, but doing so in a way that restores certainty to the international tax framework. As you will recall, uh, there were a whole range of unilateral measures and uh, fragmentation in the international framework, and, and that was leading to all sorts of conflicts. In some cases, trade tensions and trade retaliation. So Pillar 1 is very much about uh, bringing uh, those rules into the modern economy to reflect the fact that taxing rights can be allocated in certain circumstances where there is no physical presence and to bring some certainty to the international tax system. Uh, it's less about revenue and more about that objective. Pillar two, on the other hand, involves the global minimum effective corporate tax rate. And the agreed rate of 15% uh, is to be implemented through a range of rules. And it is very much about ensuring that there is a multilaterally agreed uh, minimum or floor when it comes to uh, the taxation of, of corporations uh, across the globe. Uh, as I said, it's not intended to eliminate tax competition completely, but it is uh, an effort to put in place a multilaterally agreed floor. And what you will see from the results that we share with you today is uh, substantial revenues uh, available for collection by governments uh, if they implement and when they implement uh, the two pillar uh, solution. And of course, we are seeing many jurisdictions already moving in that regard. Uh, the EU and its 27 member states just before Christmas indicated uh, that it, in adopting its directive, that its member states would implement pillar two. And we're seeing a whole range of, of jurisdictions across the globe uh, that are also either consulting on legislation, implementing legislation, or announcing their intention to do so. So pillar two is very much a reality. And so as we take you through the revenue estimates, I think it's important to bear that in mind uh, that we are now uh, so much closer uh, to seeing uh, the revenues that are estimated uh, being available for governments uh, to collect in the not too distant future. 
Now, the estimates that we produce today, uh, the good news is that we are finding that the revenue gains are even higher than previously expected. There's a number of reasons for that, and we'll take you through that in detail, but they principally relate to issues such as improved quality of the data that is available to us, but also taking into account the most recent design changes. But um, irrespective of, of all of those uh, dimensions, uh, this is a study like all economic studies where it's important to recognize that there are many caveats and limitations to what can be modeled and to the estimates that are produced. Uh, we will take you through in some detail what those caveats and limitations are. But I do want to say that I do believe and very proud of the work that the team has been doing. I do believe that this study uh, stands head and shoulders above others that have been released to this point. Uh, it is very strong in terms of the comprehensive nature of the data that has been drawn upon. And the methodology, I think, is as robust, if not more robust than any others that are out there uh, at present. And importantly, uh, what we model is very closely aligned to what has been agreed thus far. And I think that's something that sets this study apart from many others. So without further ado, I'd now like to launch into the, the detail of the, the presentation. And to begin by saying that this work builds upon earlier work that we've previously published. Many of you would be familiar that in 2020, we released an economic impact assessment, a very comprehensive one, uh, but um, there have been significant changes in the design of both pillars since. So that's why this is an important update. And I should say one of the principal purposes of our work is to inform uh, delegates of the inclusive framework on BEPS as they make key decisions around design elements of the two pillars, but also as they make judgments about whether or not to agree to these solutions and to implement them. Uh, that's the principal objective, but of course, uh, on occasions such as this, it's also our pleasure to be able to share with the public more broadly uh, some of these results. Now, what we produce in these estimates at this point is global revenue estimates for both Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. But in the case of, of Pillar 1, we also produce jurisdiction group level estimates. And that means you'll see estimates that affect low income, middle income and high income jurisdictions, as well as investment now, we, we don't do that for Pillar 2 at this stage. We're uh, carrying out ongoing work and uh, do not have those results to share, but we will be sharing those results in the not too distant future when we release uh, the next tranche of the impact assessment, which we expect uh, to do in the coming months. As I said earlier, overall, the results suggest additional revenue gains for both pillars. Now, Moving on and drilling down into uh, the detail of some of the main results. Uh, what we can see is that um, overall revenue gains have increased uh, and with higher revenue gains accruing to low, middle and high income jurisdictions under Pillar 1. So when we look at Pillar 1, uh, we see um, in particular, if we look at the 2021 year, which was a particularly profitable year for those in scope firms, we see an estimated annual global revenue gain in the order of 13 to 36 billion US dollars. Now, um, uh, the average across uh, the 2017, 2021 period is uh, 12 to 25 billion US dollars. Uh, but this stems from uh, the calculations that have been undertaken to determine the amount of residual profit that has been allocated under amount A. And when we last reported on this figure, we reported a figure of 125 billion US dollars, uh, but what we see is 200 billion dollars of, of uh, profit that will be the subject of uh, this new taxing right. And the new taxing right that we'll see um, that, uh, that uh, taxing right exercised by market jurisdictions. As I mentioned, low and middle income jurisdictions gain more than high income jurisdictions as a share of existing corporate income tax revenues. Of course, that's not the case in terms of absolute numbers because many uh, low income economies are, are smaller economies. But as a share of corporate income tax revenues, we see low income jurisdictions gaining uh, at a higher rate uh, than uh, their middle and high income uh, counterparts. 
We also see that investment hubs face increased revenue losses on average. And you'll see that one of the principal drivers of that relates to the latest rules on the elimination of double taxation. Now on pillar two, the global minimum tax, uh, our estimate has increased to 220 billion US dollars. And that's based on 2018 data, which is the latest available in order to, uh, to model uh, pillar two. And uh, uh, that is something that is up uh, from earlier estimates of around 150 billion US dollars. So a significant increase in revenues there as well. And we are carrying out further work uh, and we'll be reporting back to you all in the not too distant future on the jurisdiction group results. Now, moving on, um, what are the factors accounting for these increases in revenues? As I mentioned earlier, design changes. Take pillar one, for example. The last time we modeled pillar one in that economic impact assessment in 2020, uh, the scope was very different. We were talking about consumer facing businesses and automated digital services. It's now a more comprehensive scope, but with a higher threshold. We also have more recent and, and better data. And uh, just to point to one area of improvement in that data, just before Christmas, uh, we released the latest round of country by country report data. This is the anonymized and aggregated data, which shows that um, we have significantly increased the country coverage. And that increased country coverage means that uh, the areas where we have to extrapolate uh, and estimate data uh, have been reduced because we have uh, more hard data in the first instance as a result of more countries reporting and more country coverage. And there have been some changes in modeling uh, in order to improve our estimation approaches. Now, moving on uh, to the next slide, uh, it is worth noting that uh, some of the design features that have been agreed, and I think this is a really important story, is that uh, through the negotiations, various design features that have been, in some respects, I think, hard won gains uh, for developing countries and low income countries, they have actually flowed through in terms of the revenue outcomes that we expect. And for example, in pillar one, uh, a couple of design features uh, are worth mentioning. Special nexus thresholds, um, the tail end revenue provisions in the revenue sourcing rules, uh, as well as the de minimis rules, uh, particularly those that relate to the elimination of double taxation. These are specific design elements that have been uh, agreed as part of the ongoing negotiations. And we find that they are all contributing towards improvements in the revenue position of low income jurisdictions. So higher revenue gains as a result of uh, the very effective negotiating uh, that has occurred through this process uh, by many developing countries. We, we find the same thing for pillar two in terms of um, the, the general assessment uh, about what we will expect to find when we do uh, produce jurisdiction level results, jurisdiction group results, uh, but the UTPR allocation key is an, is an important factor. And of course, the qualified domestic minimum top up tax will have a big impact in terms of uh, changing the nature of the allocation of where the gains of pillar two uh, will fall. So that gives you a little bit of a sense at a, a very high level uh, of some of the key findings. What I'm going to do now is hand over to Anna Sinta, who is going to begin by taking us through some elements of the, the data and methodology that have been relied upon. And then after Anna, we'll move on to Pierce O'Reilly, come back to Anna, and then I'll be back uh, with you a little bit later on to, to wrap up. Over to you, Anna. Thank you, David, and, and welcome everyone. Um, so as David has said before discussing, but also before discussing the changes to the data and, and methodology used to provide, to produce these results, it's useful also to take a step back and provide some context about the previous work we have performed on the economic impact assessment. So the OECD has continuously provided support to delegates over the course of the negotiations by informing the economic impact of the two pillars. And as, men, as David has mentioned, in 2020, we released the first economic impact assessment. And that first EIA was based on the pillar one and pillar two blueprints. And at the time, many design features of both pillars were not yet agreed upon by the members of the inclusive framework. And that meant that the results that we produced were based on a large set of parameters and assumptions on what the final design features uh, would be. 
the economic impact assessment was then updated at the time of the 2021 October statement. And we released only global uh, figures um, at, at that time. But since the early 2020 economic impact assessment, the design of both pillars has significantly changed. And this has motivated the need to, to really update and, and revisit uh, the figures in terms of um, revenues uh, that were produced earlier on. Today, we will present to you an updated uh, revenue estimates that are based on the latest agreed design features of, of both pillars. And in this presentation, as, as you have just heard, you will find updated revenue figures for pillar one at the global and jurisdictional level, and only global figures uh, for pillar two. And we will discuss a bit more in detail as we go along uh, the current work that is currently being undertaken to arrive at, at, at jurisdiction uh, group results also for, for pillar two. The analysis as, uh, of, of this kind basically comes with a, a range of caveats that are important to account for when, when interpreting these estimates. So first, uh, the methodology needs to rely on a number of simplifying assumptions, and that refers, for instance, to certain design features of the pillars, but also on some of the behavioral reactions of MEs and, and governments uh, to the introduction of, of the two-pillar solution. Second, uh, while compared to the initial uh, economic impact assessment, now most of the parameters of the pillars have now been agreed, there are still discussions ongoing about certain design elements. So the revenue estimates are produced based on, on some illustrative parameters. And what this implies is that ultimately the impact on the revenue estimates will largely depend on the final design parameters that, that are to be agreed by the members of the inclusive framework. Lastly, uh, the Secretariat seeks to rely also on the best available data, but of course there are some limitations regarding availability and coverage and timeliness of the data um, that are to be uh, considered, even though we try to do our best to, to, to have the best available. Most notably, uh, the data that, that, you, that we're using predates certain, um, certain important events such as the COVID-19 pandemic, the global increase in inflation and some of the uh, changes in international taxation, such as the ongoing implementation of BEPS related measures and the uh, US uh, Tax Cuts and, and Jobs Act. So with this in mind, we just wanted to, to put this out first uh, so that the, you have this information when interpreting the, the results. This slide uh, moves now more a bit into um, providing you an overview of the methodology and of the data uh, that we are using as, long as, as well as of the key design features that we're modeling for both pillars. So starting with uh, data methodology, the approach that we're using is largely based on the economic impact assessment in 2020, but we have made certain methodological improvements and extensions to better capture the design of both pillars. We use more up-to-date country-by-country reporting data. So we built on the 2017 and 2018 vintages, which is a great advantage compared uh, to before as uh, the coverage of CYC data has uh, greatly expanded over time. To set an example, uh, profits from country-by-country -country reporting account now for 82% of the total profit in our matrix or in our data compared to 63% uh, when we did the assessment back in the day, back in 2016. Uh, using 2016 data, sorry, referring to the economic impact assessment in 2020. We now also make additional use of Orbis data in our, in our analysis, and you will hear more that this uh, has been a key source of data for, for Pillar 1, but also more generally um, on our matrices. And we have done also some other methodological changes that have gone to ensure better data quality. So we introduced more data quality checks, but also new validation, data validation procedures. And you will hear more about this from peers shortly. So what design features are we able to capture uh, with the methodology? In what refers to pillar one, uh, the modeling is based on the amount A progress report. And importantly, it includes the revised scope of pillar one that now goes beyond automated digital services and consumer facing businesses. We, this includes, of course, also the losses, the losses and averaging rules, and the estimate account also for other design features, such as revenue sourcing rules, the revised nexus rules, the tier approach to the, for the elimination of double taxation, including the de minimis thresholds, and the market and distribution safe harbor. The design of the latter is still under discussion in inclusive framework, so we need to make some assumptions on these parameters, but simply for, for illustration. 
purposes. The estimates for Pillar 1, however, do not account for withholding tax rates and uh, withholding taxes, sorry, so, and this is due to uh, data limitations. In what refers to Pillar 2, the modeling is uh, based on the Pillar 2 model rules and hence do not include, so the focus on the globe rules and do not include the impact of the subject to tax rule. Um, the estimates account for the revised substance-based income exclusion, which is a function of payroll and assets in the jurisdiction, the revised under tax a payment rule allocation key, which is a, based on the pre headcount and the value of tangible assets. Um, and the estimates assume a consistent application of the globe rules across jurisdictions. As I mentioned before, there is ongoing work that is uh, that we are carrying out in on Pillar 2 to better examine the existence of low tax profits in high tax jurisdictions. And this would allow us a better assessment of the impact of qualified domestic minimum top of taxes. So in other words, while um, um, the, the modeling of qualified domestic minimum top-up taxes is something that we are that we would be accounting for in the pillar two assessment provided that we and that's why we are carrying out this this part of the of the work in better measuring the pockets of low tax profit. Zooming in a little bit on the data that we're using, this slide provides you a snapshot of the data sources and the data structure that we're using in this work. So the analysis builds on five data matrices, and these matrices, but they contain jurisdiction by jurisdiction information on the location of profits, turnover, assets, employees, and payroll of InScope MEs. So, in other words, what they seek to do is to map M &E act the activity of InScope MEs at the jurisdictional level. If you were to compare this to the economic impact assessment in 2020, you would know that we have one more matrix, uh, which is the employee headcount matrix, and this is because now it's part of the under tax payment rules. So how are these matrices populated? So as we said beforehand, CBC is a key data source, uh, but we use a wide range of, of data sources in as part of this analysis. And this includes firm level data such as Orbis, and we'll see this plays an important role for Pillar 1, but also other aggregated data sets on MNE activity, for instance, the activities of multinational data set, as well as other macro level data sources. So with this, um, I conclude that the short overview of the data and the overview of the modeling approach. Um, and I give the floor back to Piers, who will present on the Pillar 1 methodology and results. Thank you very much, Anna, and uh, hello, everyone. So turning to the next slide on, on Pillar 1, just to give an overview of, of how we go about estimating the revenue impacts of Pillar 1 on a jurisdiction basis, we use this equation here. This equation has not really changed um, from the previous uh, economic impact assessment, just to, to go through it briefly. If you look at factors A and B there, we basically first uh, calculate the amount of residual profit in scope. So uh, I'm sure any will, will know that residual profit is designed as, as, as profit above uh, a 10% return on sales. So for the in scope m &Es, we calculate the residual profit. Then we multiply that by uh, factor B there, which is the reallocation percentage. So that's 25% uh, as specified in the uh, October agreement. And that gives us the total amount of profit that's actually being allocated under Pillar 1. And so we start with that, and that's a global figure. And then turning to factors C, D, E, and F, these figures then are country specific. Um, and they help us understand what any individual jurisdiction or group of jurisdictions is going to gain or lose in terms of tax base for a uh, third one tax base and tax revenue. So starting first with the parameters C and D, for each jurisdiction, we calculate the share of sales that that jurisdiction earns um, from the in-scope m &Es. So that's factor C, their share of destination-based sales. And that's going to determine what each individual jurisdiction receives from this uh, you know, pot of tax and rights that's described by factors A and B. So we calculate C for each jurisdiction, and then we multiply that by, by factor D, which is the tax rate, the statutory tax rate in each of those jurisdictions. And that allows us to, to calculate essentially the gross gains that any individual jurisdiction is going to, is going to get. Then when it turn, in terms of, of, of potential losses or, or surrender of taxing rights or relief of double taxation, there's different, different words are used to describe it. Then we, we calculate those in factors uh, E and F that you can see there. 
And what this basically means is that we, we calculate in factor E exactly how much each individual jurisdiction is going to put into the amount they pot, how much tax uh, are they going to be obliged to relieve under the new system. And then we assume then that that profit is then relieved at the effective tax rate in that given jurisdiction. And that allows us to understand the, the gross losses uh, that that jurisdiction may experience uh, uh, that will go into the overall net benefits uh, or net losses that that jurisdiction may experience under a day. So it's a simple uh, equation or, or relatively simple, but you can see there in the details is that uh, relative to the previous impact assessment work that we did, we updated each one of these different parameters to account for the latest available data. That's in terms of the, of the size of amount A, the tax rates being applied, the amount of profit and so on. And we've also taken care to, to as David mentioned, you know, describe in detail these new design features, many of which weren't uh, outlined in detail in the Pillar 1 blueprint, but are now available in much more detail in the amount A progress report. And we're able to capture those really in, in quite a granular level of detail. Um, and, and some of those uh, design features then turn out to really matter for specific jurisdiction groups, uh, revenue estimates. And so that can include things like the revenue sourcing rules, exactly how the revenue is sourced under amount A, the marketing and distribution safe harbor, and uh, also the rules on the elimination of double taxation, which uh, govern which jurisdiction are, are, are obliged to relieve, uh, uh, relieve double taxation and, and therefore essentially surrender uh, taxing rights. So that's the overview of, of what we've done. That's how the, the estimates are carried out uh, and we calculate each of those uh, specific factors. So just turning then to, to the next slide and I'll try and talk a little bit really about kind of the major methodological innovation that we've, we've engaged in as part of this revised, uh, revised revenue estimate. And so the problem that we initially faced really in, turn, in terms of doing this revised revenue estimate was the changed scope. So uh, as David mentioned, we have a new scope relative to what we previously modeled. Before, we had focused on any m and &E with global revenue above 750 million. Um, that was in either the ADS, uh, Automated Digital Services, or CFB, Consumer Facing Businesses Sector. But the scope as outlined in the progress report is different. Um, it focuses really on the, the very, very largest MEs in the world. So there's a global revenue threshold of 20 billion. And it's, but it's also, it's narrower in that sense because there's a higher revenue threshold, but it's also broader because it's no longer just um, focused on the uh, digital services and consumer facing goods sectors. It's much broader. So it includes things like B2B services and, and, and B2B products. Um, and so we included those as well. Now, what that does then is that it actually reduces the number of MEs that are in scope of amount A relative to our previous estimates. We estimate that there are about 100 MEs in scope, a little bit more. Um, and that meant that in terms of trying to understand exactly who would receive and surrender taxing rights under amount A, we really needed to go as granular as possible for these specific MEs to get quality revenue estimates. Um, and whereas before we, we really relied on the aggregated and anonymized CBASIOR data, here we're trying to rely where possible uh, on financial information for these specific set of 100 odd firms. And so what we've done then is if we've tried to build matrices for each individual MNE that outline for you know, a given you know, uh, company in scope, where are their sales country by country by country by country, where are their profits country by country by country, where is their uh, turnover, where is their, their, their assets, where is their payroll, all of those features we try to do at an M&E by m and level, and then we essentially apply amount A to those m &Es. Um, and so if we just go to, to the next slide, it kind of shows what that looks like in a little bit more detail. So this is what, what we would refer to as kind of a sample matrix. And we, we think about the, the data that we use really in these terms. And you can see basically, whereas before when we were doing this work, each column of the matrix was a country. Now, essentially each column is an in-scope M&E. So we have a, a matrix for, uh, as Anna mentioned, we have a matrix for profit, for turnover, uh, for payroll, for employees and for assets. And then we, we populate uh, that matrix for each individual m &E. So each, each column is, is an m and &E and we map the location of, of those m and um, activities uh, around the world. 
How do we do that? So first of all, if the MNE has publicly available financial information, we use that data. Many MNEs obviously publish financial information uh, at the consolidated level, but they also provide uh, an, a reasonable level of detail, especially for some um, for some financial variables like sales at the, the jurisdiction level. Where that data is available, we use it. Then where that data is not available, we impute the data from a variety of other data sources. And so that's uh, often from the country by country reporting data, but also where, uh, where possible, we use sectoral data from the US Bureau of Economic Analysis. And that allows us to, to take a much more granular approach to, to a, a, specific, a specific sector. So for example, if we have uh, an American pharmaceutical company um, you know, with with operations, and we want to know how how much operations it has in France. We will look at US BEA data for US investment of pharmaceuticals in France, and you know that that's how we will populate that specific cell if we don't have detailed data for that M specific M and E. So we build up those matrices for all of the in-scope M and Es, and then we essentially apply amount A to those M and Es. And because we have this granular data, we have a value for every M&E in every country in the world, we're able to apply amount A in a lot more detail. Um, and so that means, you know, taking into account the detailed rules on elimination, taking into account the detailed rules on revenue sourcing, on nexus threshold, et cetera, et cetera, that allows us to, to try to look very closely at the impact of some of these design features. Um, and that's something that we've tried to communicate to inclusive framework member jurisdictions along the road of this process. So they understand exactly what each design feature they're, they're talking about and considering what each of those design features actually does. So then turning then to the, the next slide, we were, we were conscious of the fact that even though we were doing this at an M&E level and we were using you know, the most data that we had available, there isn't that much uh, publicly available country by country uh, data for the in-scope M&Es. And so we knew because that, that, that you know, exactly what the revenue consequences of a MNT are going to be are going to be really conditional on exactly where these M&Es have their profit, their sales, their assets, their payroll, et cetera. So with that in mind, we tried to go to the jurisdictions that have in scope MEs, go to the jurisdictions that we knew had better data than we did, and and talk to them essentially about our results. Um, there's limited amount of data sharing that we could engage in because uh, the jurisdictions are are heavily banned by confidentiality restrictions. But what we've done is basically shared aggregated pictures of of the data that we have built and tried to get them to validate that for us. And so the result of that exercise is, is broadly speaking, the jurisdictions were able to tell us that we got pretty close. But in certain ways, they were able to tell us that, no, your, your analysis is, is off and you need to adjust this or that factor. In, in particular, the, the first iterations of these matrices, we were putting insufficient amounts of profit in investment hubs in general, relative to what the, the IF member jurisdictions that had done this analysis themselves were telling us was there. And so it's, it's adjustments like that that we have been making on an iterative process and uh, on an iterative basis with all of the uh, all of the in scope, uh, all of the, the IF member jurisdictions. And obviously, we're, we're very, very grateful for all of the work that they have uh, put in in uh, in assisting us with this with this with this process. So that's the, the work that we've done to validate this this exercise, which is, uh, has taken us some time, but we think really um, adds to the, the credibility of, of this exercise. So if you go to the next slide. The other piece of work that we've done here is to try to extend the time series uh, that we cover in this, in this analysis. So we rely a lot, as I mentioned, on CYCR data to populate these matrices that, that I've spoken about and that Anna's spoken about. Um, the latest available CYCR data that we have is for 2018. Obviously, that's uh, quite some time ago. So we want to try to see, could we develop more up-to-date results? And the way that we've done this is basically because we knew we had data on uh, the publicly available financial information of the InScope MEs for more recent years. So the InScope MEs, you know, many of them are public or are published public annual reports. And so we have those reports for 2019, 2020, and 2021, and, and we're starting to get them for 2022. Um, and so what we did then is we we basically took the matrices that we had based on 2018, which is the latest available um, data. So we took the distribution of profit, of payroll, of assets, of sales for each of the in-scope M&Es, and then we just grossed them up or down depending on whether they're 
consolidated profit or payroll or assets or turnover had increased or decreased during the period from 2018 to 2021. So, so, so the data then we have is, is correct at a consolidated level, but obviously where M&Es have kind of redistributed activity or changed their sales or changed the location of their profit or et cetera, et cetera, these results might be off. But, but we still think that that's important to have this more up-to-date result because as I'll show you in a moment, the amount of, in, of, of profit in scope has really risen and, and it's, it, it appears to be rising uh, quite sharply. And so to provide a, a kind of a full account of, of how much money uh, is actually going to be in scope of amount A, we think it's important to try to, to, to give the most up-to-date revenue information that we, we have available. So with that, I can turn to the, the next slide, I think. So as I mentioned, the, the fact that we've built this, these matrices on really quite a, a granular level allows us to account for a lot of different design features of amount A. And this has been, been really helpful, I think, for, for delegates, because we've been able to show delegates the, the, the impact of various design features. But also then uh, we were able to, uh, you know, as part of this, um, this presentation, provide a, a level of granularity in terms of, you know, the, the, the accuracy of the results in terms of the different design features accounted for is higher relative to, to, to what we've been able to do previously or, or, or what's been in the public domain uh, up to this point. So there's a there's a laundry list of, of different um, design features there that we've tried to take account of. Um, I'll just go through a couple of them briefly because I do think that some of them are, are quite important and maybe not so well understood. We spent a lot of time trying to account for the revenue sourcing rules. So uh, in the amount A progress report is a chapter, several chapters on exactly how the revenue will be sourced. So that's, in other words, exactly where amount A will go. And those revenue sourcing rules are specific to different types of businesses. So, you know, uh, digital services might not be sourced in the same way as components, which might not be sourced in the same way as, you know, business to business services. And so we try to approximate the specific set of revenue sourcing rules that would apply to each of our 108 businesses that we have in scope. And that matters because, you know, there are provisions in the revenue sourcing rules that suggest that certain MEs might, for example, use allocation keys to allocate their revenue. And so we tried to model that where it was possible and use the allocation key that the revenue sourcing rules suggest could be used by that specific kind of M&E. And that in turn then matters because some of those revenue sourcing rules are quite developing country beneficial because they, they allow developing countries to receive amount A even if the amount of sales in their jurisdiction is very small or even if a given M&E might ha not have any physical presence in their jurisdiction, um, you know, uh, smaller jurisdictions will still get amount A and that was something we were able to account for. In addition, we also took into account what we was referred to as tail end revenue provisions in, in the, the revenue sourcing rules. And these rules provide that if an ME cannot source all of its revenue, it doesn't know exactly where all of its sales exactly are in the rules, then uh, a certain fraction of those of those sales um, that can't be sourced by the ME uh, can be allocated uh, specifically to low income jurisdictions. This part of tail end revenue, which can, is capped at 5%, can be allocated to low-income jurisdictions. Um, so we, we assume that, that half of MEs won't necessarily all do that, and it's only available to certain kinds of MEs in the revenue sourcing rules, but we assume that two and a half percent of the revenue of consumer-facing business MEs was allocated to low-income jurisdictions. And that's that's important because that's a, a feature of a mandate that can be you know beneficial for developing countries that we were able to take into account. In addition, uh, the nexus rules, there are lower nexus thresholds, for smaller jurisdictions, we took those into account. In terms of the elimination of double taxation, so this is the, the, the relief of, of, uh, of double taxation or the surrender of taxing rights, there is uh, you know, this three-tier approach to the elimination of double taxation that we were able to model in detail. And what that approach does is that it really concentrates um, the, the surrender of taxing rights in jurisdictions that have very, very high levels of profitability. And that's something that we were able to, uh, to model. And then uh, importantly as well, we were able to model provisions that are in the, the rules for elimination of double taxation um, that provide that again, there are de minimis provisions. So jurisdictions with small uh, nominal amounts of profit, even if they have high profitability, won't necessarily relieve double taxation. 
And that's something we were able to, to model as well. And there's a lot more detail on exactly how we modeled all of those features in the annex. Um, it's important to say that we have not been able to account for withholding taxes because we, we don't have good data on withholding taxes, but we have been able to model the, the marketing and distribution safe harbor. And again, there it's important to, to say that there is a, a variety of parameters still under discussion with respect to the marketing and distribution safe harbor, and we incorporate a variety of parameters into our revenue estimates. So they're, they're within the bounds of our, of our margins of error that I'll show you uh, shortly. So there, I think we'll turn now to the results. So if we could just go to the next slide. So here, I think David has spoken to most of these results uh, before. But overall, we find for pillar one that revenue gains have increased relative to the last time that we, we released public figures on this, and we find that they're rising over time. Um, so the latest year of data that we have available is 2021, and for that year, we find that there's about 200 billion in taxing rights are allocated under this system. So the in-scope M&Es have about 800 billion uh, in profit, 25% uh, of that is, is allocated, and so that's about 200 billion uh, US dollars. This allocation results in, we estimate, somewhere between 20 and, and 35 billion um, in, in tax revenue gains. And I'll talk about why that is uh, a little bit more. But, but broadly speaking, those revenue gains come from the fact that profit, profit taxing rights over, uh, over profits are essentially being shifted from jurisdictions that are relatively low tax to jurisdictions that are, on, on average, a little bit higher tax. So when that shifting uh, happens, when that allocation happens, that means then that basically there's um, there's revenue gains. Importantly, then that 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 shifting is is concentrated away from um, investment hubs who tend to be more profitable than other kinds of jurisdictions. So under the revised approach to eliminate elimination of, of double taxation, they they give up more, and they tend to also be quite low taxed. So because of that, that's essentially raising our revenue gains because the, the, the place where the profit is coming from is uh, currently uh, quite low tax, and that's what's uh, raising our revenue gains. I'll show you in, in a second, but broadly speaking, we find that revenue gains accrue to most uh, kinds of jurisdictions in the inclusive framework, low, middle, and high income jurisdictions. We tend to find that uh, investment hubs uh, lose revenue. We tend to find that low and middle income jurisdictions, as well as smaller jurisdictions, benefit from the design features that David spoke about and I just spoke about. And so it's in large part due to those design features that they tend to gain more as a share of, of CIT revenues relative to, to higher income jurisdictions and then also relative to uh, investment. So with that, uh, that's a, an overview of the, oh no, that, that's a, an overview of, of some of the results. As I mentioned, uh, estimated losses have modestly increased in investment hubs. That's in large part due to the revised approach to the elimination of double taxation. Um, and then I, I think it's important to note that, I mean, we have this kind of steady increase in the amount of profit that's in scope, but obviously, you know, economic conditions uh, can change. And you know the levels of profitability that are, are that we see in these in these uh, in scope M and E's for 2021, and, and we do see them for the the 2022 data that we've looked at so far. But but that may not continue, and if it doesn't, the amount of, of profit that's allocated under amount A may fall from this uh, 200 billion figure to to a lower figure, depending on on what the future holds. So this next figure just shows uh, the overall growth in the number of m &Es that are in scope, uh, which is the red line there, which you see is, is slowly rising over time, um, but at a kind of a, a fairly modest pace. Um, and that's really because either you know, m &Es are becoming more profitable or m &Es are growing. And so they're uh, growing in terms of their revenue. So they're passing above the global revenue threshold and there's more and more coming into scope. And that's then is driving an increase in the amount of profit that's in scope overall, which is the blue line. But what you can see in the chart there is that the blue line is, is rising much faster than the red line. And so what that means is really, you know, the amount of, of profit that's being allocated under amount A in our analysis is, is rising over time. But that increase is, is more due to the M&Es that are in scope and the M&Es that stay in scope. They are getting more profitable and they're getting bigger. So the, the, the increase in revenue is not really driven by new M&Es coming into scope. It's, it's the existing M&Es that, that are in scope and stay in scope have gotten bigger and more profitable uh, over time. 
So turning then to, to the next slide. So just looking a, a little bit more closely at, at who these MEs are and what, and what kind of MEs that we have actually in, in scope of the, of the rules. You see there again for the, the set of years that, that we cover that we have a, a variety of different uh, kinds of MEs in scope. As I mentioned, you know, the, the scope has become broader than the, the, the scope outlined in the Pillar 1 uh, blueprint, which focused on consumer-facing businesses and automated digital services. Now we have you know, business to business uh, uh, companies in scope. So they could be supplying services, they could be you know, engaged in kind of in the middle of the value chain, manufacturing chemicals or components that are used by other businesses. To, um, to to you know make consumer goods or provide other services. So, so there is there are some major B two B firms in scope that we didn't have in our in our previous analysis. But I think it's really important to say that the the you know the scope of firms is still very much digital and kind of technology focused. And so you can see there that you know things like electronic uh, manufacturing, so you know, consumer electronic goods are in. We have a significant amount of profit coming from broadcasting and software and programming information. So those are kind of major uh, tech giants and so on. They're in scope. And, and just lastly, then it's it's important to say also this was the COVID-19 period was, was 2021 that we do see a, a sharp growth in the profit, profitability of the, the pharmaceutical sector as well. So that's really kind of describing exactly the kinds of businesses that are that are in scope of the of the, the pillar solution in in uh, in 2021. So the next slide then shows the global net revenue gains. A couple of things again we, we see here over time um, our uh, range of of, uh, of revenue gains in, in our models we have a high and a low and there's a few a few points that are important to note. Obviously you see that the the global revenue gains are, are broadly on an upward trend. Um, that's due to the fact that the amount of profit in, in amount A inside the pot is growing. It's also due to these design features that I mentioned, which tend to concentrate the surrender of taxing rights for most low tax jurisdictions and give you know, proportionately more taxing rights to uh, jurisdictions that tend to be a little bit higher taxed, and that's raising additional money. You see there that the error bars are a little bit wider um, for our more recent estimates relative to the, the brown bar there on the left, which was uh, the, the error bars for the original study from uh, two years ago. And that's in part because we model a good few different uh, scenarios for the marketing and distribution safe harbor. That's one of the, the, the options that, that is still under discussion by inclusive framework jurisdictions. And so because of that range that that uh, that accounts for why those error bars are, are, are that little bit a little bit larger. Um, but of course, the the error bars then also reflect you know, the, the various other kinds of uncertainty that uh, result from this, this kind of work in terms of, you know, we don't know exactly where the profit is. We don't know exactly where the sales are. We don't know exactly how much, you know, how MNEs are going to respond, et cetera, et cetera. So the the uh, the, the error bars then give, give a sense of the, the, the kind of uncertainty that, uh, that we're talking about. So turning then to, to what we think, how we think that these revenue gains are going to be distributed across different jurisdiction groups. So consistent with, with past practice, we don't release um, jurisdiction specific results. That's at the request of, of the uh, IF member jurisdictions. And what we do instead is that we group the IF member jurisdictions in four groups, high income jurisdictions, middle income jurisdictions, and low income jurisdictions. And that's on the basis of, of World Bank criteria. And then our fourth category is investment hubs, which we define as jurisdictions that have high FDI to GDP ratio. So their, their focus is up investment globally. So what you can see in the chart, again, we have these kind of um, you know, error bars and you see each different bar is a given year and you see the three categories of countries there. Again, you can see for each category, for each different group, you can see the revenue gains uh, you know, rise over time. They're all a little bit higher than we had previously estimated. Again, the, the trend, the time trend is, is, is largely due to the fact that the, the, uh, the amount of profit in scope has, has risen over time. Um, but in addition, then the fact that there's, you know, there are kind of some sharper jumps for certain jurisdiction groups, especially you see the, the low income jurisdictions on the right, that those factors are, are basically design. Um, and that's why we're, we're happy and pleased to have been able to account for some of those design features, many of which are quite developing country friendly. So that has led to 
larger revenue gains for middle income and low income countries specifically. And so again, it's just, I mean, it's worth mentioning them. That's the, the lower nexus threshold for smaller jurisdictions, um, the tail end revenue provisions that, that kind of you know, isolate a certain amount of amount A for, for low income jurisdictions. And then also the de minimis rules and the elimination of the double taxation mechanism that provide that smaller jurisdictions are, are in, in the model, you can see it, are just less likely to, to be giving up taxing rights in any way. We tend to find that it, you know, the, the surrender of taxing rights is really concentrated amongst investment hubs now, and we tend to find that low and middle income jurisdictions really aren't surrendering any taxing rights at all. The figure is not, not zero, but it's, it's very, very close to zero. So just turning then to the, the, the next slide, and then you can kind of see the, 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 the converse of the revenue gains for the first three set of jurisdictions. I should say that the y-axis in this chart has just gotten longer. Um, so the, the three jurisdiction groups, high income, middle income, and low income jurisdictions, you see that they're the same results there. They're, they're showing uh, revenue gains as a percentage of CIT. But then the last um, part of the chart there essentially shows the, the scale of the uh, uh, surrender of taxing rights for investment hubs. And you see that with the change in design, we do anticipate that investment hubs will lose a certain amount of taxing rights and therefore will lose a certain amount of, of, uh, of tax revenue. And that's uh, really a function of the revised approach to the elimination of, the, of double taxation. Although it's important to say that that, depending on, on the design of the NDSH, a certain amount of that impact is partially offset by the NDSH. So I think with that, I will pass to Anna to uh, briefly discuss pillar two. Thank you, Piers. Uh, so with that, we move to, um, this uh, discussing the, the methodology for pillar two and some preliminary results. So as you know, pillar two specifically, the global rules would set up a minimum level of effective taxation at 15%, which applies on a jurisdictional level. So profits in excess of the substance-based income, income exclusion, which is which provides basically a recognition for the level of assets and, and payroll in the jurisdiction, are basically topped up to 15% whenever those profits are facing an ETR that is lower than the minimum tax. So in principle, how does the methodology work? So this is a very similar um, formula or way of, of, of displaying the formulas for pillar one. Um, so first, um, I'm, this would basically give you the revenues uh, for a given jurisdiction A from the application of pillar two. If you look at what comes after your equal sign, the first item that we want to estimate is the global amount of low tax profit. So in this um, methodology that, I'm just, that, that we are looking at, uh, low tax profit are currently present in jurisdictions with an average effective tax rate below 15%. So we can compute this part of global low tax profit. Then we need to take into account the effect of the substance-based income exclusion, which we will, will take um, away a share of these profits of low tax profit based on the amount of substance in the jurisdiction. And once you have the multiplication of these first two components, that would be the amount of global low tax profit that would be in scope for pillar two. So now to determine to move this from a base to, to a revenue indicator, then we would need to multiply it by the amount of top-up tax. So uh, the top-up tax would be given by the expression in brackets, so it would be the difference between the, the effective tax rate at which these profits are taxed and uh, the minimum uh, rate, so 15%. So by multiplying these uh, four uh, first boxes, then we would get the total amount of uh, revenue gains coming from pillar two. And then we would have to allocate uh, these total revenue gains coming from pillar two to different jurisdictions. And for that, we would look at the last uh, factor, which would basically um, be um, allocating these revenue gains based on the charging provisions, so the income inclusion rule and the tax payment rule, or um, as we will discuss later on, also um, jurisdictions have the option to introduce a qualified domestic minimum top up tax, which would mean that the revenue gains stem from low tax profit in the jurisdiction is basically um, retained in the jurisdiction where these low tax profits arise. So this would give us a general expression of um, how we are looking at estimating these um, pillar to revenue gains uh, on a jurisdictional level. And similar to uh, what we said for pillar one, we have uh, conducted a series of, we have updated this 
this figure is to reflect the, the newest available data. So we have uh, updated the amount of low tax profit. We have a renewed methodology to compute effective tax rates uh, that MEs are facing in the different jurisdictions. And we include also the different uh, new design parameters that I mentioned beforehand. So we have a substance based income exclusion that are um, now based on the revised parameters agreed on the October statement. That is, it's based on the on the value of the tangible assets and, and the payroll that sits in the jurisdiction. We now model a 15% tax rate, which we were uh, using as a baseline 12.5 beforehand. And um, we're also um, taking into account when we look at uh, the, the, um, the allocation of, of uh, pillar two revenues, uh, the new allocation key for the uh, for the under tax payments rule. Um, we will discuss a bit later on uh, because, of course, one of the one of the key things of pillar two or, or the trickiest things about uh, having um, the distribution of revenue gains for pillar two is particularly how this revenues or this global pot of uh, pillar two revenues are ultimately allocated across jurisdictions. And here uh, we're doing some work to um, to basically tease out how, or it was basically very depending on the ME and the jurisdiction responses. And we're doing some work to, to be better able to assess the impact of, of these assumptions. So I'll I'll pause on, on that and I'll refer back to, to this ongoing work in a second. So using this methodology, I'll now transition to uh, show you some uh, key results about um, how the global revenue gains from, from Pillar 2 have evolved. So as you can see in this chart, this would be the, the total amount of, of revenue gains from Pillar 2 has been uh, has increased since our uh, early estimates. So compared to the, the previous estimate that was uh, communicated in October 2021 of uh, 150 billion, we estimate that the revenue gains uh, of Pillar 2 has been increasing. And the central estimate that we're looking at for 2018 is about 220 billion. Of course, there is a, a margin of uncertainty around these estimates, but we can see this, uh, this increase in trend. Where is this margin of uncertainty coming from? Uh, as I said beforehand, revenue gains from Pillar 2 include the direct revenue gains, so from implementing a minimum tax, so topping up low tax profit, but also uh, include some indirect gains from Pillar 2, because Pillar 2 will set a minimum floor of uh, or an effective floor of um, at 15%. Basically, it will it will decrease tax rate differential causing a reduction of the, or reducing the incentives for MEs to shift profits. And this would be the indirect gains from, from MEs, which translate into higher revenue gains. These estimates, these effects are also captured in the estimate that you're seeing here. And part of these uh, error bounds that you are seeing reflects particularly this uncertainty about the, the behavior of response of MEs. But also it tries to reflect uncertainty about the behavioral responses of, of governments. So how would governments react to implementation of Pillar 2? In terms of the growth of these uh, of uh, revenue gains from Pillar 2, one might wonder where, where does this revenue growth come from? And we can boil that down to three uh, key reasons. The first is, as we mentioned beforehand, we have now better data on, on the global low tax profit. And this is uh, largely due to the expansion of uh, C by CR data. So now we have better data coverage. I mentioned now 82% of the profits uh, that we cover come from C by C, whereas we were looking at 60% beforehand. That means we need to we we can rely more on hard data and rely less on extrapolations in in the location of these uh, of these profits. Uh, the second reason is that even if we hold the the um, the data source that we're looking at constant, we do see an actual increase in low tax profit over time, at least up until 2018. And that occurs in, in both investment hubs and non-hub jurisdictions. So there is a real increase in the amount of low tax profits that are behind uh, this revenue gain. And lastly, um, is the assumption you know, the assumption that we use that there is a consistent application of the globe rules um, across uh, the, the across the sample, which is also behind uh, some of these increase in, in in the revenue gains. As um, I mentioned beforehand. We are looking at this um, at the global revenue gains arising from pillar two, mm -hmm. and these uh, computing this 
overall revenue gain is slightly easier than computing the distribution of these revenue gains uh, by countries. And the reason why it's relatively more easy is because part of the distribution of uh, these revenue gains by countries would depend on the country's behavioral jurisdiction's behavioral reactions. Um, and I'll move to the next slide to explain to you why what, what type of ongoing work, ongoing work we are doing to better be able to assess or be, be able to provide a better um, understanding of this distribution of revenue gains. So um, the methodology that I mentioned beforehand, when we look at um, the amount of low tax profits kind of stemming from pillar two, uh, the sum, we look at the average effective tax rate that MN is paying in a given jurisdiction. So we would say if uh, MN is in a given jurisdiction pay an effective tax rate below 15%, then um, all the profit in the jurisdiction would be considered low tax. And by definition, then we would consider that jurisdictions that have an average higher tax rate uh, than 15% would have no low tax profit. To the extent that jurisdictions that are on average high tax have some amount of low tax profit, then there would be revenue gains arising from, from pillar two, potentially. And that would add up to the revenue gains that I mentioned beforehand. However, the methodology that we have right now doesn't allow us to look at these um, pockets of low tax profit in average high tax jurisdictions. And if one wants to think about reasons why there might be pockets of low tax profits in high tax jurisdictions, one can think of, for instance, the presence of tax incentives. So jurisdictions that have, for instance, intellectual property regimes in the jurisdiction might be on average high tax. Um, so might, we might be looking at an effective tax rate above 15%, but actually, if we were to look at specific MEs, there might be pockets of low tax profit that would be subject to pillar two. So um, we thought this was an important consideration that our the current methodology was not uh, accounting for. So how does uh, the distribution of uh, low tax profit or getting a better handle at the distribution of low tax profit in average higher tax jurisdictions? Um, and this is also an important consideration for modeling also some of the behavioral response that we might want to consider. Uh, so, for instance, um, if we were to um, um, to look at uh, different behavioral reactions, so for instance, if countries were to, if certain jurisdictions were to introduce qualified domestic minimum top up taxes, having a better handle of the low tax profit in high tax jurisdiction would allow us to better capture uh, these uh, sources of revenue. So that's basically why we're doing this kind of work um, at present. So we think that. Um, Having um, once we're able to to better handle the location of low tax profit in high tax and low tax jurisdiction, we would be better able to um, to model the impact of, for instance, qualified domestic minimum taxes, and then have a better uh, handle at the distribution of revenue gains across different income groups. So we hope that with um, we will be able to report back to you when we have um, carried out some of these data and are able to break down these global revenue figures um, in a similar way as you have seen for pillar two, for pillar one, sorry, uh, for pillar two purposes. Uh, so with this, I conclude the update on on the ongoing work on on pillar two and hand back to David. Well, thanks very much, Anna, and thanks, Piers, for for taking us through in some detail. Uh, the, uh, the the various um, methodological and data issues that uh, I think demonstrate the amount of work that's gone into this uh, this analysis. I should say that uh, the work that we do at the OECD Secretariat is done very closely with uh, the delegates of the Inclusive Framework on BEPS, and in particular members of Working Party Number Two. Uh, and uh, this is a group that. Uh, you know, is not really uh, widely known and, and often you won't uh, get to, to see the delegates of Working Party too. But I want to take the opportunity to thank those delegates for the huge amount of work that they have done, uh, both in providing guidance and, and support and sometimes uh, constructive uh, uh, comments around the approach uh, to the modelling, uh, but without their, uh, their support and without, uh, in particular, uh, in, in certain respects, their validation of, uh, of some of the data sources uh, this type of analysis would not be possible. Uh, but the other side of that is, I think that because of those efforts, uh, the, the analysis is, is certainly strengthening. Now, if we can just move to the, the final slide, uh, which is in relation to ongoing outreach and next steps. Uh, I, I should say that there are a series of uh, 
uh, more technical annex slides uh, that we have not had the opportunity to take you through in detail at this session. But uh, when the slides are posted on the website, you'll be able to, to go through those at your leisure. Uh, and uh, as we uh, have indicated, uh, there will be further tranches of, uh, of impact analysis. Now, um, ongoing work, as Anna just mentioned, we're doing further work in relation to Pillar 2 uh, to um, bring together uh, and, and produce some jurisdiction group level results. Uh, we have those for Pillar 1, but not yet for Pillar 2. And that will involve the work that Anna just described in getting a better understanding of uh, pockets of low tax profit in high tax jurisdictions, but also being able to make some assumptions around uh, the extent to which qualified domestic minimum top up taxes are implemented. Uh, we will, of course, uh, as has been the central objective of this work, continue to work very closely with jurisdictions to help them understand the provisions of the, the two pillar solution, uh, and uh, particularly as they evolve, but also as, as key decisions are looming. Uh, as part of the ongoing negotiations. Uh, and, uh, you know, I know just in the next week or so in particular, uh, Pierce and Anna and the team will be doing a series of, uh, of, of virtual meetings. Uh, uh, they'll be supplementing those with some, some physical meetings later on as well, but a series of virtual meetings with uh, representatives from a range of developing countries uh, in order to be able to, uh, to uh, help those delegates uh, inform themselves of the key issues, but also be able to, uh, to, to brief their ministers and, and others within their governments to make sure that the decisions that they take are fully informed. And we will be publishing uh, a full impact assessment uh, with the detailed methodology, which will um, take much of what has been presented today and uh, present that in, in the form of a, of, of a paper, of a report, uh, and that will be released in the coming months. And of course, uh, comments and feedback are welcome. Uh, we have uh, also been engaging with other international organisations uh, with whom we work very closely. Uh, the IMF in particular, uh, who uh, we have uh, uh, discussed these issues with uh, uh, regularly over the last several years uh, and, uh, and continue to do so. And this uh, webinar will be a little bit later uh, in the day. It, Will take a few hours, but will be posted uh, on the uh, on the web page that you have a link for there in front of you, uh, and uh, this will also be available with uh, captioning that will allow uh, those of you that may want to view the the presentation in another language to do so. So uh, that's uh, really it in terms of the presentation itself. I should say that we've received an enormous number of questions. Uh, so thank you. Not only do we have, uh, I think at one point we had more than uh, uh, 1,300 participants. Thank you for participating, but uh, thank you for participating so actively. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a couple of dozen uh, questions. Now, we're not going to be able to get through all of those, I'm afraid. What I would propose to do is uh, uh, perhaps, um, Piers, um, there might be a sort of a, a laundry list of a couple of these uh, questions that you can group together and run through quickly and answer. Uh, there's one or two questions that I'll come back and, uh, and answer a little bit later on. But Pierce, would you like to, uh, uh, to begin by looking at, at some of those questions and providing some responses? Uh, thanks, David. Um, and thanks to everyone who's, who's asking questions. Uh, I will go through them in, in, in no particular order, but trying to, to say some of them that are, that are kind of roughly, uh, Roughly aligned. Just in terms of the overall amount of, of profit in scope, we had a question about whether it comes uh, from inflation or, or better data. So in in terms of the, the total amount of profit that's in scope, I think that's one area where we feel quite good about the data that we have, because it's based on the public financials of the in-scope MEs. And so those are, are publicly available and we can we can quite closely um, you know, estimate the amount of, of profit that's in scope. I should say that the one reason why the amount of profit in scope might be a bit too low in our estimates is that we don't account for segmentation. So if there are segments of uh, firms that we have out of scope that might be in scope, we don't have them in. Um, so that's that's one important thing to bear in mind. Um, someone else asked about what, how much uh, how how much of the two hundred billion will will wind up in a different country relative to what it's it's currently in, and that's an an important question. The the 
revised approach to the elimination of, tax, of double taxation now means that a lot of the surrender of taxing rights comes from investment hubs. And so because those investment hubs tend to be quite small markets, we expect that the amount of profit that, it, that winds up in a different place to where it originally uh, started uh, to, be, to be quite substantial. A bit does depend on the design of the marketing and distribution safe harbor. So what that does is that it provides the jurisdictions with residual profit um, uh, have their amount A uh, reduced. And so depending on the extent to which that happens, that can, can change the amount of, uh, of amount A that, um, that, that essentially kind of uh, goes in a circle, uh, as, it, uh, as it were. Um, further questions there's a there's a question on on how the marketing and distribution safe harbor was taken into consideration as its design is still under for consideration there are a range of different parameters in the progress report expressed in brackets so there's a there's a, an offset percentage in brackets where we use a range of parameters um for, for that offset percentage from from 25 percent to 100 percent and we allow the MDSH to, to, to we model the 25 and we model the 100 and a few parameters in between. And those are featured inside our error bars. So that's the way that we try to deal with the uncertainty uh, surrounding the, the precise design of the MDSH in, uh, in that way. Um, I think that that's, uh, there's a question about, about how do we deal with the obligation to mitigate double taxation uh, of amount A. So essentially what we do is we, we allocate the profit on the basis of the revenue sourcing rules, and then we assume that all of the profit is relieved. Um, and then that we do on the basis of the rules for the elimination of double taxation. So we assume for each jurisdiction, you're going to receive X dollars in profits. And for each jurisdiction, you're going to give up if you if you end up uh, giving up profit, which many jurisdictions don't. But we, we, we model then how much profit those jurisdictions give up. And then we assume that the profit that, that you give up is, is um, that, that, that then impacts your tax revenue, depending on the effective tax rate that's applied uh, uh, to that profit. Um, I might stop there, David, and, and maybe you could come in and I could see are there other kind of pillar one methodological questions that uh, keep coming in. Yeah, thanks very much, Pierce. And uh, I can see some questions there uh, in relation to pillar two. Um, Anna, would you like to uh, to respond to some of those? There's one about whether or not uh, QDMTTs are likely to have an impact in increasing uh, the overall amount of uh, revenue expected under Pillar 2, and also some, uh, some uh, questions around the general um, expectation in terms of behavioural responses and, and things of that nature. Anna, would you like to, uh, to provide a response to some of those issues? Sure. Um, so um, I think the question on, on whether QDMTTs would drive potential revenue gains. Um, so as I said, we're now, we now have more of a, our revenue gains are concentrated on countries that have an average tax rate below 15%. So we observe no pockets of low tax profit or no revenue gains coming from countries that are on average high tax. So to the extent that these revenue gains or these low pockets of low tax profit basically would translate into, into revenue gains from pillar two, then we would expect this uh, 220 figure to grow. Now, it's important to say as well that, um, that even if we locate low tax profits in, in high tax jurisdictions, we need to also account for the fact that there is a substance-based income exclusion that would reduce the amount of profits of, of low tax profits. So to the extent that, that, that that there could be an increase, but we need to take into consideration also the substance based income exclusion in, in, in modeling, like or in estimating how much more revenues the QD entities would increase from, um, from basically this low tax, uh, this, uh, this low tax profits in, in high tax um, jurisdictions. Um, we have also a couple of questions in terms of uh, whether QD entity implementation would be something that that uh, governments would consider, and this is something that that we are already seeing uh, in some in some jurisdictions, and this is why we think it's important to carry out this work um, to have a better picture of the location of low tax profit in order to be able to to assume uh, that this could be a rational response from governments as well in in implementing this qualified domestic minimum top up taxes. Importantly, because it would allow them to collect these um, low tax profits arising in the jurisdiction. Um, 
in priority to, to other countries. And what is relevant also like this, another question that came up in terms of um, the what is the, the, the source of these low effective tax rates and whether we can tie them up to the existing of certain tax incentives. And the answer is that we, we basically observe these effective tax rates. They are coming from, 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 from the hard data that we have in, 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 in our matrices. So it's, it's backward looking effective tax rate data. Uh, we don't see the, the reason behind this effective tax rate, but there is reason to believe that tax incentives would be, uh, of course, one of the important factors uh, behind these uh, low effective tax rates. And I'll pass it over to, to you, David, and happy to answer any more. Right. Uh, Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Anna, and I think that's uh, that's been helpful. Uh, as I said, there are a lot of questions. We can't go through them all, but uh, there are a couple of questions that go to the uh, issue of uh, how these uh, results relate to other studies. Uh, I see in particular a question about uh, developing countries and that some studies uh, that have been previously released by others um, suggest that uh, developing countries have, uh, have been worse off as a result of uh, uh, the, the pillar one uh, design elements and, and agreement. Uh, and we're being asked to, uh, to account for those differences. Uh, look, I, I guess I would respond um, by making a couple of points. And the first one is that uh, just to restate what we find uh, on pillar one in relation to low income countries, we find that uh, they gain uh, at a greater rate uh, compared to their current corporate income tax revenues than middle income and high income jurisdictions. Obviously that's on average across those groups, but uh, there are some good reasons why low income countries are doing better uh, as a result of recently agreed changes. On the other hand, you have the investment hubs where uh, we see losses of tax base and, and tax revenues. Uh, but um, there are a number of things and we've tried to highlight them through this presentation, but for example, the, uh, the tail end revenues, um, the, the de minimis thresholds, um, the use of allocation keys, um, you know, these are all design elements, as I said earlier, that have been hard, hard won uh, by, uh, by developing countries. And they, they do actually move the needle in terms of the revenues uh, that we expect low income countries to receive. Now, I should say that uh, often these are some of the more difficult elements to model. And a lot of effort has gone into trying to model these elements. Uh, there are no other studies out there that, that take uh, those elements, all of those elements into account. So we do think that this is giving a much, uh, a much more accurate picture, notwithstanding all of the uncertainties that any study, any impact assessment will face. And we recognize those. We don't pretend that this is perfect because no study is, uh, but we are taking those things into account. Yet we note that many of the, uh, the various studies out there uh, gloss over these issues, which we find to be really significant for, for low-income countries. But just to, to make a couple of observations, one study that I, I recall reading not long ago, uh, it, uh, on this question of the relief of double taxation, it, it attributed all of the relief or shifted the burden of all of that relief to headquartered jurisdictions, which we know is just not correct. That's just not the way these rules uh, are going to operate. Uh, now, whether that was just a simplification in terms of the assumptions made in the study or, or, or whether it was uh, motivated by other considerations, I, I don't know, uh, but it is, it is not an accurate way of trying to model the impact. Uh, and, and as I think Pierce mentioned earlier, uh, particularly with the recent changes to the elimination of double taxation, we see a uh, greater concentration of uh, uh, the effort of relief uh, falling on investment hubs uh, and, uh, and, and, and very little of that in most cases, none of that falling on low income countries who benefit from that. We've also seen studies where, for example, um, we've seen uh, uh, the researchers allocate all revenues simply on the basis of GDP, which is a you know, very, very rough way of doing it. Uh, we've sought to work very hard to try and get a more granular assessment of, of how those uh, revenue should be allocated. So uh, without commenting on, on specific, calling out specific studies as such, uh, I think that there, there have been a whole range of studies out there. Many of them, I think, uh, have, have not always taken into account the latest details of the design. We think that we have done that better than anyone at this point. But of course, uh, it's always important to approach these exercises with a degree of humility because 
Uh, we don't have perfect data. We think it's better than most, uh, but it's not perfect data and we are required to make assumptions. So I hope that uh, provides a response to, uh, to that particular question. Now we are um, running out of time. Uh, I might just check with Pierce whether uh, he can um, perhaps pull together one or two of the remaining questions uh, and answer them. Uh, but once again, we apologize that we're not going to get to all of them, but please feel free to, to reach out to us on the, uh, on the contact email. Pierce, can I uh, call on you to, uh, to have one more uh, uh, effort at responding to some of these questions? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess a few different people have asked about, about the data and about CYCR in particular. Um, so there's a slide at the end of the deck that shows the data sources of this round of the impact assessment compared to previous rounds. And we have benefited a lot from the expansion in the coverage of the CYCR for 2017 and 2018. So we're, we're able to just cover a lot of the profit in the world with CYCR. We don't have good coverage of the co all the countries in the world, but we're able to account for about 85 to 86 percent of, of all of the profit uh, in the world by using the CYCR data. And that's that's been really helpful. Um, somebody asked what, what the impact of that is on developing countries. And I think, I mean, you can see that there in in the charts that we've shown where you can see the revenue gains increase over time for developing countries we had a couple of questions on dsts so our, our we do not account for dsts in in the model so if someone has a, a dst and they, and they repeal it that would be lost revenue that we don't take into account um but so, some, someone else asked basically you know do we do we think pillar one is is raising more revenues than a, than a dst would it's not a question that we have looked at closely but there are studies that say yes it does so there's one was done by the african commission that shows very clearly that uh pillar one uh for, for reasonable assumptions we think um would raise would raise more than than a dst and as david said you know like a lot of studies i know that that study did not account for some of the design features that benefit developing countries. So, so again, there, we, we think that that study probably also understates uh, revenue gains as well because of, of these design features that we've, we've tried to take into account. Um, I'm just looking to see, is there, is there anything else? I mean, there's, there's other data on, on, um, on Q, QDMTTs and Pillar 2. I know Anna has, has spoken to that. Um, we will be doing more of that in the in the coming weeks and months and, and hope to revert. Um, and I think, David, I'll, I'll probably stop there. Um, maybe there's there's a couple of their questions on, I don't know, implementation, if you and there's also a few questions on on data and release of release of data and, and country data and stuff. Yes, yes. Um, I, I think, uh, as Pierce indicated earlier, um, we, uh, as has been our practice in the past, where we have uh, produced uh, jurisdiction specific results um, uh, we uh, we have not released them publicly and that's because of the uh, the discussions that we've had with countries uh, and it has been their preference not to uh, not to release those results uh, so um, uh, that of course is something that we have in relation to uh, to pillar one but for the same reasons that we don't have the jurisdiction group results for pillar two uh, we we do not uh, have them at this point and uh, any country specific results for pillar two will be very much dependent upon the ongoing work that we are doing uh, in relation to uh, the location of low tax profit, but also QDMTTs. Uh, if I could perhaps just uh, as a final remark, uh, um, pick up on one of the points that Pierce made about uh, DSTs. And yes, there is the direct revenue impact. And as Pierce points out, uh, there are some studies that suggest that uh, pillar one generates um, significantly more revenue uh, than um, DSTs. Uh, when we look uh, at uh, the particular results that we're producing, uh, sometimes in particular cases, uh, it certainly would be consistent with that. But we don't have a complete handle on the, the revenues that are being generated by unilateral measures that may be uh, in place. Uh, so we're left to point to those other studies. Uh, but I would make one additional point, and that is this, that um, we need to go back to where we started from. And uh, the problem is that if you uh, view the alternatives between uh, amount A of pillar one and a DST, then we go back to the very problem that uh, really provided much of the impetus to this project. And that is that unilateral measures uh, have uh, uh, this tendency to provoke trade retaliation, 
uh, and all of the, the negative spillovers, uh, trade spillovers that come from that. And uh, just to pick up on one of the points of analysis that existed within our 2020 study that continues to be relevant for these purposes, is that we estimated that under a worst case scenario of, of widespread implementation of digital services taxes, with all of the in attendant uh, trade retaliation risks, uh, that that has the potential to reduce global growth by more than 1%. So, you know, there, there is, of course, the revenue question, uh, which, as we say, um, there are studies that suggest that pillar one um, is, is, a, is a better option. Uh, but even if you extend beyond the revenue questions and you think about the impact on the stability of the tax, international tax framework, but also uh, the health of the global economy, um, there are some very powerful reasons uh, for why countries are working hard at the negotiations to try and reach agreement. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, to leave my remarks there um, and to just perhaps end where I started, and that is to say that we are uh, very pleased to be able to share this latest research with you. Uh, we will be coming back uh, with a more detailed um, piece in the coming months. Uh, that will go into even more detail in terms of the jurisdiction group impacts of Pillar 2. Uh, but what we are releasing today demonstrates uh, uh, what we expect will be increased revenue gains under both pillars, um, in, in particular uh, under Pillar 2 and the global effective minimum tax, which, as I mentioned earlier, is already becoming a reality with uh, uh, the EU and many other countries already moving towards implementation. Uh, in terms of Pillar 1, countries continue to work towards agreeing a text for a multilateral convention, uh, and that will be needed in order to implement Pillar 1. Uh, but we see uh, the importance of that in terms of uh, being able to stabilise the international tax framework. So I'd like to conclude there to thank the team for all of the work uh, that they've done over a number of years, to thank our delegates for the support that they've provided. Uh, and uh, of course, we stand ready to, uh, to answer other questions and in particular those that we did not have time to answer today uh, bilaterally with those that are asking them, uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, please uh, uh, take care, stay healthy, and uh, we look forward to coming back and reporting on our future work in the not too distant future. Thanks very much. <laughs>